I'm Sonia Klein, and I'm a Holocaust survivor. I'm Jordan Mello Klein. Um, I'm Sonia Klein's grandson. I'm Alan Klein, and I'm Sonia Klein's son. This is our Holocaust story. This is our Holocaust story. This is our Holocaust story. I was born in Warsaw, Poland. Life was not easy. I, I was 14 years old when the war started, September 39. I had a sister and a little brother. I survived. My sister survived with me. I became her parent, but my little brother was gone with the Nazis and my mother and my father. I was a pioneer to the war. I was in Warsaw Ghetto, Majdanek, Auschwitz, Ravensbrück, Tauchau, and a death march. I worked at the Schuhkommando in Auschwitz, taking apart the shoes of the guest people. We were taking apart the soft leather from the hard leather that was returned to Germany. I, my working place was right next to the crematoria and the gas chamber. How can I remember it? Because things like this, if you live 1,000 years, you cannot forget. I was liberated by the Germans, by, by the, I'm sorry, by the Americans. Uh, them in Leipzig, the center of Germany. I, we were, they kept us for three weeks, they fed us. And then after three weeks, they said to us, you're free, you can go. We had not decent clothes on our bodies, not a penny to buy anything, and not a piece of bread, which meant life. And we would go walking down the street, my sister and I, and in Auschwitz, we adopted a third sister. Why? Because I said, if, the biggest if in my life, if I ever live, I will never go back to Poland. And she had family in Argentina, so we adopted her. So if, we survive, we would all go to Argentina. We never did go. We went. The Americans said to us, you're free. Free to go where? We're walking down the street and a train, a coal train comes along. We look at the train. Coal trains are very high, you know. We look at the train, the three of us, and look at the train. Why didn't we look at the train? I don't know. The three of us did not weigh 120 pounds. How we got on the train is one thing I do not know, because I remember most of the things. How we got on the train, how long we were on the train, and where the train was going. The train went to the border of Germany and Austria. And this is when he stopped and uh, we had to get off. In this the small town in Germany and 1000 men were liberated by the Americans because the Germans did not have enough time to kill them. They were brought there to be killed, but there wasn't enough time to kill them. The Americans liberated this part of Germany and 
uh, made a uh, a camp, a displaced camp, prisoners camp. This, when we got off the train, my brother-in-law to be was at the train station. You know what? Nothing in life happens by chance. Everything is meant to be. Whether we realize it or not, everything is meant to be. Why was he that day at the train station when we got off the train? The three of us, not black, not white from the call. And he looked at us and he said, who are you? We, we didn't eat, I don't know how many days, but a person can survive longer without food than without water. He said, oh my God, come, I take you to a place to eat. As we were that walking down the street with him, my husband-to-be was with a German. There were nice people everywhere, but not enough. A German family, all the family, took in my husband-to-be and his two friends to the house. Every morning brought a tray of scrambled eggs, mashed potato, milk, which was life. That was life. Knocked on the door and left the tray. So my husband was not in the displaced persons camp. As we were walking down with my brother-in-law to be, my husband says, who are the girls and where are you taking them? He says, today everything is closed here. But I have food. How did they have food? Aside from the tray that the German woman brought to them, there was this American battalion stationed there. The three men, my husband to be, he adopted a brother, two brothers. They went to the Americans and they said they want work so they can get food. The three men didn't weigh 150 pounds. The Americans looked at them and said, oh, okay, you come here every day, you eat, and when you get a little bit of flesh on your body, we'll talk about work. Well, the Americans opened number 10 cans for the soldiers of peanut butter, jelly and other things. Took out a few spoons for the soldiers and what is, they didn't need anymore, take it, take it. So my husband had plenty of food. But the Americans left and my husband remained in Germany. And I met my husband walking down the street now, you know what? I didn't think of it then, but I'm thinking of it now at my age of 97. Never asked my husband to be what language he speaks. He was not from Poland. What if we could not understand each other? What would happen? What would happen? I knew him two weeks and we got married. Why did? Why did I ever get married? Not know. I, I wasn't, I really didn't know who I'm marrying. But I needed a piece of bread and I needed a, a pair of shoes. Since shoes that were given to me in Auschwitz when they took us out, froze to my skin. And I was liberated and wanted to get rid of the shoes after the death mark, they had to cut away my skin with my shoes. Well, unfortunately, we had to live in Germany four and a half years before we had a visa to the United States. Now, 
every time we walk the street, the three of us see skeletons. The people said, "How can it be? How can it?" How can how can you bury the twelve million people, six million Jews and six million non-Jews? It doesn't make any difference. Human beings. How can you bury the twelve million people and not know anything about it? Impossible. It wasn't easy, but then in uh, uh, December forty nine. We finally got a visa to the United States. Now, it was not easy here because we did not know the language. But we were free and not hungry. And first, I have to thank God Almighty because no human being gets two lives. Human, a human being gets one life. Those of us who survived were given an additional life. And for this, you can never be thankful enough. And I have to thank the United States for giving us a country because we would never go back where we really came from. And then I have to thank the people in the United States for trying to help us and do the best. And uh, my husband passed away 22 years ago. Uh, when I say it, I, I really don't believe it. And I moved from, I, we were sent to, we ducked in Boston. A social worker picked us up from the Federation to take us from the boat to a train to Buffalo. Now, she, one thing she said that I will never forget, when you are not born here, the city you come to becomes your hometown. I lived in Buffalo 35 years, 37. Then when my husband retired, we moved to Florida. My husband passed away. My sister was sent to New York. So uh, I tried to get to be together with my sister. Because when, when everybody was murdered, I became at the age of 14, her parent. She was young, two years younger. So I became her parent. I came to New York uh, 17 years ago. And again, left alone, no one to turn to until I was told about self-help. I had a friend who was with me in Germany. And when I came to New York, she said to me, you want to come to a luncheon? I said, yeah, maybe. Why, what luncheon? Self-help. What self-help? Who is self-help? Well, I, she said, so call up. I called up, I talked to a person who became my social worker later on. And let me tell you something. Right now, again, I have no one, but no one here other than self-help. If anything happened, the first number on my telephone in emergency is my sons and self-help because it's self-help that I can turn to. They understand, they're compassionate, and I don't know how life would be without self-help. Because my mother was a Holocaust survivor, um, her experiences were mine at a very early age. As a little boy, I heard their stories and and I was uh, frightened and traumatized. And I once pulled her aside and pointed to her numbers. And I said, I don't want those numbers on me. I, I thought that I would have to go to the camps. And so she uh, began to avoid talking about things for a long, long time, at least till I grew up. Now, now the numbers that are on her arm 
are on two of my son's arms as well. Jordan has them, them tattooed on his arms. And I think that uh, everything that frightened me as a child took me a lifetime to sort of come to terms with and uh, use it as a strength rather than a stigma of some sort. What's, what's, uh, what's important is the, uh, is the fact that what happened to her and the other millions of people that perished in camps in the Second World War is something that isn't one of a kind. It continues on into the present. And so we need the testimony of all those people who survive every single one of these forms of genocide, whether it's Uganda or Syria, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that people who survive speak up and speak out and their children learn these lessons. And I, I think they, they become stronger over time. For me, it was a trauma that I had to overcome, but for my children, Jordan and his brothers, um, it's a source of pure pride and they derive much more strength from her story uh, than even I do in some ways. It's some, I think it's important to me because uh, like my dad just said, it's, it's a little bit different of an experience for me. I wasn't raised really around it. They were a little bit more weary um, about like telling me stories about it until I was a bit older. But since then, since about like 14 or 15, I've really um, become prideful of it. Like, like he said, um, it's not, it's not much of a stigma. It's something that when I got uh, the tattoo, obviously it was kind of taking back the power. Like they kind of tried to dehumanize her and just like um, minimize her to a number. But I, I tried to take that back and, um, you know, it's, it's way more than a number. She's way more than a number. Her story obviously is, is more than that. And I think she's done a great job of, um, passing that down to to me through just stories and and through her courage of of being able to even just speak about it it's it's obviously really special for me to see that i pledge to remember join me and pledge to remember <laughs>